I'll go ahead and start us off as people find their seats. So hello, my name is Aaron Willis. I'm the director of Ignatian Formation and the Bannon Forum, the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara University. Um, and on behalf of Michelle Burnham, Amy Randall, uh, the Center for Arts and Humanities and the Bannon Forum, I'm happy to welcome you all to tonight's event, Disrupting Narratives, The Power of the Humanities, with Dr. Wendy Roberts. Before we begin, I would like to pause to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone, Mwakma Ohlone people. We remember their connections to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders, to all Ohlone people past and present. Tonight's event celebrates both National Humanities Month and Santa Clara University's Mission Week. And since the first Jesuit school opened almost 500 years ago, the humanities and the arts have been part of any <clears throat> educational experience that we might call Jesuit. Early Jesuits recognized that truly educating a person so that they might flourish both professionally and personally required a deep engagement with the arts and humanities. Fundamental to the mission of Jesuit education is to humanize our students so that they might humanize the world. The words delivered on this campus by Hans Kolvenbach, uh, a previous superior general of the Jesuit order, measure of our university's success is who our students become, not what they become. So the arts and humanities offer spaces for students to explore and reflect on what it is to be human, how individuals and communities make meaning, how we flourish in all of our diversity, and how to bring our full selves into the task of transforming the world into a more just, humane, and sustainable place. And to bring about this world that we hope for means grappling with deep questions and ideas. The arts and humanities speak to a myriad of these foundational questions. Where do we find beauty, joy, comfort, kinship, belonging, transcendence, and meaning? How and why is our world the way it is, especially in all of its brokenness? And what does justice actually look like in practice? This institutional mission and vision meshes with that of the National Arts and Humanities Month. This month is meant to illuminate, quote, the crucial role of the arts and humanities in promoting individual well-being, addressing trauma, connecting cultures, highlighting inequalities, and making our communities healthier and stronger. Divorced from a complex understanding of humanity, our efforts at transforming our broken world will fall short. And this is what leads us to the theme of tonight's event. As we continue to the ever-evolving journey towards justice, among other things, the arts and humanities help us to question the narratives we are often presented with about our past, present, and future. In charting our course forward, narratives deeply shape our understanding of the roots and nature of the problems we face and the possible futures we see for our communities. Without the ability to critically engage with these narratives, our horizons are significantly narrowed and likely serve the interests of those who already have large amounts of privilege and power. And so I'm grateful that tonight at the heart of our mission week, we are able to celebrate the deep legacy of the humanities within Jesuit education and its centrality to the future of our call to form students of competence, conscience, and compassion who can transform the world into a more just, sustainable, and humane place. So I'm now happy to invite uh, Jose Villagrana, assistant professor in the Department of English, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker today, not least because uh, we met for the first time 18 years ago um, uh, when I was uh, first quarter undergraduate at Northwestern. And this person uh, helped me uh, s uh, stay within my studies and grow. So I. Um, present to you uh, Wendy uh, Rafael Roberts, um, who is Associate Professor of English at the University at Albany from the State University of New York, and author of Awakening Verse, The Poetics of Early American Evangelicalism, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. This book was awarded the 2023 Early American Literature Book Prize. Robert's research on early American poetry has been supported by grants from the American Antiquarian Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, 
the Huntington Library, the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. And now she is currently working on a book exploring Phyllis Wheatley Peters' poetic uh, coteries and manuscript presence, which was recently awarded an NEH fellowship for the 23-24 year and has been supported by grants from the New England Regional Fellowship Consortium, the Beneke Library, and the Library Company of Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Roberts. So much, Jose, for that kind introduction. Um, got me all teary just because you never know, right? When the student that you're talking with, what they take away, um, and then you know, then they're your colleagues. So that's so cool. <laughs> I love that. Um, so uh, I don't really recognize myself in that introduction. I'm definitely an imposter, so I hope you will be kind to me uh, today. And I'm going to kind of walk you through um, the state of archival disruptions in Wheatley Peter studies right now. And then um, I'm going to go so fast because I didn't want to bore you with too many details, but I'm going to try to hit three new poems or sort of new poems from my research and then hope that you're kind to me and the kind of huge generalizations or speculations that I'll make. Um, so first, um, I do want to thank the Bannon Forum and the Center for Arts and Humanities uh, for hosting me, um, along with the Pre-Modern Studies Group and the University Library. I got to go sit uh, with Nadia and uh, with Jackie to look at your holdings. Uh, they're amazing. And I got to talk with your uh, students in the back doing um, uh, creative and scholarly work. And it's exciting uh, to be here uh, to see that. Um, and um, so it's a great time right now. It's an amazing time to study Wheatley Peters, one of the greatest poets of uh, America. And if you don't know her work, I'm excited to introduce it to you. Uh, and if you know her work well, I'm really grateful to have um, interlocutors to be able to um, talk about the ways her poetry challenges us to rethink what we think we know uh, about early American history and culture. And I'm told the uh, Center for Arts and Humanities themes this year of solidarity, resistance, and imagination, um, which are great themes, and those are themes or ideas that are essential to beginning to understand Wheatley Peters' work and her words and legacy um, that have been kept and cared for from the 18th century to today, primarily by black thinkers, creatives, activists, and friends. Um, and as a white woman who has lived and learned in predominantly uh, white spaces and institutions, including graduate school, uh, where I was first introduced to Wheatley Peters by Betsy Urkula, I'm indebted to that care and work, which made it possible for me to add uh, whatever I can today through my research. Um, so on the screen, yes, it's working, great. Um, on the screen right now, you're looking at an 18th century manuscript copy of Wheatley uh, Peters' poem on atheism, uh, made by a Quaker, an incredible new archival artifact that I'll return to near the end of this talk. Uh, but for now, I simply just want to read the first line, where now shall I begin this spacious field? Uh, because it's an apt question for any scholar or student approaching the expanding field of Wheatley-Peters studies. Um, Wheatley-Peters, uh, as you probably know, is often referred to as the mother of African-American literature, the first black person, and therefore also the first black woman living in British North America to publish a book. And because it was a book of poetry, also the first to publish a book of poetry. And this was all um, in 1773. And we celebrate her 250th anniversary of that publication of that book this year. 
Um, and so while it's important to celebrate her fir firstness, and that tends to draw an audience, um, this can be, and it's been a source of inspiration for many, it can also underwrite triumphalist stories of American exceptionalism, liberalism, and white supremacism if we just leave it at that. Uh, because of course, black people around the globe have been creating and writing and publishing, depending on how you define that, throughout human history. And as Hortense Spillers pointed out decades ago, a series of first publishing events serves a white literary tradition. Instead, Spillers emphasized black women's writing community, right, to re-envision the emergence of African-American authorship as a collective event rather than these series of firsts. Um, so the emphasis on firstness can also continue a narrative that enslavers created that of the genius or exceptional black person that can then be used to justify the demeaning or inequitable treatment of the vast majority of black people. So the question of beginnings is vital in the study of Wheelie Peters. Um, the poet and scholar Henri Fanon Joffer's award-winning book, The Age of Phyllis, uh, which is a hybrid of historical scholarship, original research, and poetry, makes explicit the importance of beginning the poet's life, uh, who will later be known to us as Phyllis Wheatley Peters in West Africa. Jefferson's researched, exacting, and informed speculative biography is an argument for why it matters that we center Wheatley Peters' life in the people she cared about most. First, her parents and kin, most likely in the Senegambian region, and friends such as Ober Tanner, also enslaved, and husband John Peters, a free man, her new kin that she chose as she put together her life in America. While enslavers and those that aided and abetted them promoted and then remembered Wheatley Peters primarily in relationship to themselves, Jeffers reads through and beyond the White Archive to show the girl who became Phyllis Wheatley when she was about seven years old and became named for the ship that caged her and the enslavers who believed they had the right to own her. Instead, to show that girl whose name we can never know, but that she knew, flourishing and loved by the parents who named her and taught her, perhaps even to write Arabic. Jeffers rightly takes uh, Margaret O'Dell's early 19th century biography of Wheatley Peters to task for its white fantasy about slavery as family and its dismissal of her husband, John Peters, and it reminds us that it matters not only uh, that we teach and learn from Wheatley Peters, but also what, how, and why we do so. This point is made explicit in the landmark special issue of the journal Early American Literature on Phyllis Wheatley Peters by its three editors, Tara Bynum, Bridget Felder, and Cassandra Smith, um, which if you want to start anywhere uh, studying Wheatley Peters, that's an excellent place to start. In 2021, um, a year after the publication of Jefferson's poetic biography, um, came another monumental archival disruption. Uh, Cornelia H. Dayton published an article in which she situates Wheatley Peters' life after she married John Peters, a part of her life that was obscured by a lack of known archival records and misdirection by Odell's biography. The legal papers that Dayton unearthed reveal that John Peters was a learned and enterprising man, a grocer, a lawyer, representing himself and other black people in court, and for a time, a landowner who created space for Wheatley Peters to write. These new findings required the rewriting of part of what has been considered the most authoritative biography of Wheatley Peters, uh, Vincent Coretta's biography of a genius in bondage. <clears throat> Coretta also released a new collection of Wheatley Peters' writings uh, published by Oxford in 2019, uh, which is a treasure for the field and is essential for seeing the chronology of all her known works that were published or variants written in her hand. Um, and this year, the historian David Waldstriker, who has for some time now argued for Wheatley Peters' centrality to understanding the American Revolution and slavery, uh, just published a biography of Wheatley Peters as well. Among the many gems in it is his provocative speculation that she may have published poems anonymously in newspapers. 
So the hard work of scholars in the archive and the support of those that fund them, uh, the dedication of archivists and the friends or foes that purposefully, indifferently, or accidentally preserved for a variety of reasons aspects of Wheatley Peters' life and works is enlarging what we have to work with. I'm hopeful that her second book manuscript, which was never published, will be found at some point. Um, in the meantime, I'm here to talk to you today about a few archival pieces that I've come across in my own research and why I think they're significant. And as I said in the beginning, there's so much more to say about each of these. Uh, so I'll just show you some. And in Q&A, you tell me what you want to talk about. Uh -huh. <laughs> OK? So about 10 years ago, I was researching um, at the Massachusetts Historical Library uh, Society for my first book, uh, which is on evangelical poetry in the 18th century. Um, and though it might sound strange now, uh, in the 18th century, poetry was central to life, uh, to social life, political life, religious life, and evangelical poetry was thought to be essential to true conversion. I had a chapter on Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and I was always on the lookout uh, for possible manuscripts by her or about her. Um, and so one day I called up a poetic miscellany. Um, manuscript poetic miscellanies are a kind of commonplace book, um, and a commonplace book is usually a bound book, sometimes a, a, a sewn book with blank pages that a copyist would copy things into uh, that would be of interest to the copyist. And, they wanted to remember it. Uh, they wanted to have it close at hand, share with friends. Uh, there could be many uses and ways of keeping them. Um, it's important to think of them as social books, not personal diaries or notebooks. Um, and they took a great amount of uh, care uh, on being made and created and were valued by the, by the creators and users of them. So commonplace books. So poetic miscellanies are collections of many poems, usually by different poets, but they're also um, ones that are by one poet. And this one happened to be by one poet. You're looking at the index of it. Um, and you'll notice on page uh, 51 uh, is the poem Slavery. Um, this is a poem about Wheatley Peters and the importance of her book to the abolitionist cause, written uh, while her manuscript was en route to London in search of a publisher in 1772. It was written by the Bostonian white poet Ruth Beryl Andrews. Uh, so finding this was the start of a more earnest interest for me in the manuscript networks related to Wheatley Peters. Uh, for the most part, literary scholars have focused on her printed works and her journey towards publication as the most important aspects of her uh, poetic career. But we actually know that manuscript culture was incredibly important in the 18th century and not viewed as second-class writing the way many of us might view it uh, now. What would studying Wheatley Peters' poems in manuscript and circulating in a robust 18th century manuscript poetry culture yield that had not been fully considered? And could such a project yield up more than a focus on the interests of the white copyists and the white coteries that circulated them? And these are questions that I'm still wrestling with. So at the beginning of 2022, I visited the Historical Society of Pennsylvania to continue research because um, it holds several of Wheatley Peters' known manuscripts written in her hand, as well as a copy of one of her early poems on atheism made by the Quaker poet Hannah Griffiths, who was central to a poetic coterie in Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley that was known to circulate Wheatley Peters' poems. So I came across this commonplace book, uh, which looks a lot like the other commonplace books kept by Quaker girls, taught by the Quaker teachers Rebecca Jones and Hannah Catherall in Philadelphia. These were women who assigned Wheatley Peters poems for their students to copy. This one was kept by the Quaker girl Mary Powell Potts, and you can see it's dated 1782. Um, in it, she copied an elegy with the heading, a few lines written by a Negro girl about 15 years of age on the death of Love Roach, her mistress. Um, 
And with much attention and research, I've come to believe that poem, uh, written in 1767, is by Wheatley Peters. And I published my reasons for this attribution earlier this year. Uh, before I say a few words about the poem and its import, um, I'd like to take the time to read it together so that you can kind of join me in thinking about it uh, at the end. Um, so I'm going to put it in the transcript part so you can follow along easier. What, gone and left us all in misery, while thou art fled up to the regions high? Repine not, but adore the righteous hand that gives the stroke. Recall the great command, weep not. I open not my mouth, O Lord, because we are instructed by thy sacred laws. Patience waits entrance at the mourner's door. We hope she's happy, but the loss explore. Let not the loss, O friend, distress thy mind. All worldly sorrows volatile as wind. Nor tremble thou, because each tedious night brings flesh af fresh afflictions to the Christian's sight. That love immerse that now inspires the pen and speaks those words thou must resume again. Ye you know not, friends, you yet may meet with joy. At consummation, every one reply. Happy, thrice happy, thou thyself shall view of grace and virtue every softening dew. Their bliss and happiness forever reign and uncontrolled sing a celestial strain. Where love and friendship universal give, there vast profuse humanity doth flow. All these enjoyed is happiness below. So I'll just say a few quick things right now. Um, anyone familiar with um, Catherine Clay Bassard's work on Wheatley Peters, um, which emphasizes her diasporic subjectivity uh, coming through in her elegies as a kind of displaced grief? Um, or the numerous scholars who have shown the complexity of her lines that speak in multiple registers at once, and particularly the political and the biographical, will surely pause over the line, um, I open not my mouth, O Lord, because, dash. Uh, the dash is, is, is pregnant. Through it, the poet is speaking by withholding speech, both in the meaning of words themselves and by speaking in another's words, you'll recognize it as the words of the psalmist. The unsaid, the cannot be said, or the will not be said, are made pal uh, palpable through the dash. And I'll come back to this particular line at the end of this talk as I try to kind of wrap things up. So a few aspects of this poem as an archival disruption. Well, I don't want to spend my time getting into the weeds of attribution during the talk. The poem and my arguments for its attribution explicitly seek to complicate how we collectively approach Wheatley Peters' archive. Um, I, like David Waldstreicher, turn to Harold Love's categories for levels of certainty for attribution, assured, confident, tentative, and speculative. And it's my sense that the field will be better for entertaining Wheatley Peters' attributions at these multiple levels. The inclusion of this poem expands the number of Wheatley Peters known to survive in manuscript alone to 12. Remarkably, it's not one of the 26 uh, non-extant poems listed in Wheatley Peters' first and second book proposals. This means that it's the only poem other than Phyllis's first effort, which is a small poem uh, Coretta uh, had found, that we had no idea existed before finding it. And as I began to study the poem and the book in which it was copied, I started to realize that the additional uh, poem not only added to her known works, but also what we know of her life, location, activities, public contributions, and influence on the larger cultural climate. So the most provocative feature of this poem is the copyist's attribution that claims that Love Roach was the poet's quote unquote mistress. Um, there's a good deal that we do not know for certain about Phyllis uh, Wheatley Peters' life, 
But the most, uh, for the most part, biographers place her in Boston when she is in the colonies. Um, of course, she took her famous trip to London. During the revolution, she fled from, uh, with the Wheatleys to Providence, Rhode Island. And her very close friend, Ober Tanner, is in Newport. Uh, she's corresponding with her. Now, with Dayton's research on John Peters, we know she lived in Middleton. Uh, what if she was in Nantucket for a while to assist Love Roach, who we know refused to leave uh, Nantucket? The Roaches of Nantucket and later New Bedford were a family that was very close to the Wheatley family, a family um, that met her when she returned from London to get a look at her book manuscript, um, a family for which she wrote one published poem and now this manuscript poem, a family that owned the ship on which her published book came to Boston, a family that became important in various abolition act uh, activities, and through word of mouth, it's been claimed that Wheatley Peter was, was hired out uh, by her enslavers before and to a Quaker family at that. What if Wheatley Peters is, ha, uh, has friends in Nantucket? Does it matter if she's more enmeshed in Quaker poetic culture uh, than we thought? Could she have been important to the decreasing Quaker tolerance for slavery that starts to gain traction in the 1760s and 70s? Could she have been central to the story of Quaker abolition? I think this small poem and this commonplace book suggests so. There's another important and new to literary historians poem placed earlier in this same poetic miscellany. Um, the Black Rose, a Negro woman of that name lately deceased, being remarkable for her innocent and sincerely pious life, Philadelphia, the ninth month, the third day, 1772. And it takes up two pages. And I'd like to take time to read it as well before saying a few words about it. Reason distinguishing twixt man and brute, one flesh, one blood, all nations constitute. The same the Sudi made on Africa's uh, coast as in the British court the brilliant toast. Objects alike of the creator's care, alike beloved, the swarthy and the fair. Precious alike in each immortal soul to the great Lord and father of the whole. Through whose effectual all sufficient grace, the faithful still inherit perfect peace. Free or in bonds of Jew or Gentile race, few want who die and leave a large estate, some servile pen to hail them good and great. The humble poor, unnoticed, sink to dust, though amicably good and nobly just, while adulation in obsequious lays to wealth, not virtue, chants the song of praise. May no low purpose ever direct my pen, reverence undue to pay to mortal men. But sordid views, degenerate customs laws, contemning in the righteous bondmaid's cause. Let worth unfeigned, it's just a logium lack. Rise, honest muse, and sing the noble black. If to be faithful in a low estate, wise without learning, without riches great, if where those relatives united blend, the tender mother, daughter, sister, friend, if where the harmonious social virtues meet and piety untainted with deceit, if in so rich a garden honor blows, illustrious then the life of honest rose. He who from guilt delivers the contrite, whose love can wash the Ethiopian white, whose wisdom can the thing of naught prepare to bring to naught the boasted things that are, exalt his little ones whom men despise and thus confound the wisdom of the wise, hath from this sorrowing veil of mortal woes called to immortal joys his faithful rose. Okay, so a lot to be said about this poem, right? Um, I'm just gonna say a few things and then hopefully we can talk more. So the copyist, um, Mary Powell Potts, you will notice, gives no attribution this time. 
Instead, the uh, header focuses on describing who the elegy is for, making sure we know she is, quote, a Negro woman. The rest of the description reads like elegies written to important Quaker women and teachers, remarkable for her piousness and with a date of death. The care taken to mark the death not only with a date, but an elegy that would attend a white person's funeral and someone esteemed in the community is by itself striking and important, as is it in tension with Quaker exclusion of black people from membership and burial grounds. Though in 1776, Philadelphia's yearly meeting finally issued an order barring uh, members who would not free their enslaved, they still did not encourage black people to integrate into their churches. A separate meeting for black people had been meeting in Philadelphia since 1756. So this poem is only one of two pieces of evidence I've been able to locate so far about Rose, who may have attended meetings because her enslavers did, or may have been manumitted by her Quaker enslaver, though the poem seems to indicate she is enslaved. The other mention of Rose is the Quaker minister and teacher Rebecca Jones, the one that I already mentioned was teaching Quaker girls and assigning Wheatley Peters's poetry to copy. Rebecca Jones's memorials, uh, a kind of Quaker biography, says this, a goodly color, uh, colored woman called Black Rose sat on a bench near the door and Rebecca in her humility occupied the vacant seat beside her at meeting. Giving the other details in Jones's biography, this means that she would have been sitting beside Rose any time between about 1751 and 1755. Um, we don't know the age of Rose, but taking the sparse details from the memorials, we can safely say Rose was at least 35 when she died. The biography emphasizes that the seat next to Rose was vacant, signaling that she was sitting apart from the white members during a time 1755, when the corporate appeal to end enslavement among friends was expressed by the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Part of uh, Rebecca Jones's conversion story, and later her work as a minister, uh, is white abolitionist Anthony Menese, who founded a school to educate black students in Philadelphia, and some of his pupils were the founders of the Free African Society in 1787, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. Though the memorials uses the moment to highlight the virtuous attributes of Jones and then quickly ignores anything else about Rose and her life, the poem, though perhaps not entirely and with its own 18th century ideas, right, does something different. First, it emphasizes her relationality. She is the tender mother, daughter, sister, friend in which the harmonious social virtues meet and she's deserving of a proper public elegy, celebrating her illustrious life. Only sordid views would say otherwise. And here the poem gets a bit difficult to parse because degenerate can be a verb or an adjective. It says, but sordid views, degenerate customs laws, which can read, sordid views also known as degenerate customs laws, or it can read sordid views, which are degenerating customs laws. The next line, contemning in the righteous bondmaid's cause, contem means to treat a person with contempt or scorn, but also to show contemptuous disregard for an order or request, such as to be in contempt of law or court of law. So what, what law? the one that upholds the righteous bondmaid's cause, that of acknowledging and singing her virtuous life and place in the social fabric, and also, as we are in the language of law, her cause before the law. So one way I'd suggest to read this line is, these sordid views about race, which are embedded in our laws right now and are degenerative, rather than regenerative, like God's laws and ways, as Quakers should be following, have the status of being in contempt of this higher law that values the bondmaid, and or in contempt 
of this higher law that is the basis of the bond maids litigation. It resonates with the idea of slave petitions and even the British Mansfield ruling in June of 1772 that changed the status of slavery in England. Rose at the back of this Philadelphia Quaker meeting during the most tumultuous years for friends deciding where they would or would not stand in relationship to slavery was doing something at the back of the meeting. And that I don't know, know much more, this poem indicates that her presence there mattered as much as the celebrated white people of high estate, that it mattered because she had a life full of relationships that mattered before God, and that was also a life that challenged Quakers and customs laws. So why even speculate here about Wheatley Peters' authorship, as I do in my article? It might seem gratuitous reaching at best in the case of this particular poem or any particular poem. Uh, and I myself am on the fence about it. But as a general idea, it doesn't seem hard to believe that Wheatley Peters wrote poems we don't have or know about to black friends, acquaintances, and important community members. She wrote a letter very early in her career to the Mohegan minister, Samson Ockham, and a fellow black poet, Jupiter Hammond, wrote a poem to her. She was in the habit of seeking and created, creating writing communities, not some lone genius in a canon of white authors. Whether or not Wheatley Peters wrote this poem, it's very likely she read it, that she knew of Rose, and that she mourned her death. And I think it's imperative that we activate those possibilities. So this brings me um, to my last archival piece I'd like to highlight today. Uh, it isn't an entirely new poem, uh, but it's a crucial new version of On Virtue, and it's copied on the same page as the poem On Atheism, which, which I began this talk. Uh, it demonstrates how crucial even small archival finds can be as we piece together more of the life and artistic vision of Wheatley Peters. And you could tell how nervous I am about presenting it, because I haven't shared it with anyone yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm presenting uh, a paper about it at the Jackson State Phyllis Wheatley Festival next week as a work in progress, uh, very in progress, that I hope uh, to have published soon. But as you were kind enough to invite me to speak today, I thought I would say a little bit about it. Um, so this manuscript was kept by the Quaker New York year, uh, Women's Yearly Meeting, uh, who valued Quaker poetry and Wheatley Peters' poem in this particular version. Swarthmore, uh, where this is found, also has a copy of a manuscript version of Wheatley Peters' book that was made and kept by a Quaker um, of the first American version published in Philadelphia in 1786. Um, and it's different from the printed version in terms of the poems copied and the order they're copied in. And I just bring that up to underscore the point that the readers of Wheatley Peters' verse in the 18th century had interactions with that verse that exceeded print and did not necessarily view print as the final and most important version, right? There was a poem for every occasion, we might say. So let's read the manuscript version of the poem in full. And I have the manuscript version here, or copy. It's not in Wheatley's hand. It might not even be the 18th century. We're in the middle of looking at the watermark right now. That's the poem, the version that's printed. Virtue, bright jewel, in my aim I strive to comprehend thee. Most impatient, but if wisdom higher than a fool can reach, I'll cease to wonder. I'd no more engage. But oh, my soul, sink not into despair. She still is near. Put forth thy hand, and she'll embrace thee. She hovers over thy head and would convene with thee. Then I look, earnest for the promised bliss. Spread forth thy wings, auspicious queen of light, and bring celestial chastity along. 
If silence reigns, let Hippocrates live. See yonder with amazement I must view, while every throbbing and smarting Horus or thorax, we'll talk about this, gay friendship dancing in a godlike form. Take the right hand of chastity, come thou, employ thyself to guide thee fifteen years, kindness and greatness, say what shall I teach thee to give a higher appellation still, teach. And you'll notice it's a catch, a catch word, which means there's another, there's another, there's another page we don't have. It's gone. Huh. So the, the last two lines, teach me a better strain, a nobler lay, O thou enthralled with cherubs in the realms of day. Um, and maybe it'd be, it'd be weird to have just two lines on another, so probably another poem, right? Um, as you can see in the side-by-side -side comparison, the versions follow each other pretty closely. The most significant uh, difference between them is the four lines in yellow versus the two lines in yellow. The printed poem on virtue has very little scholarship on it, and perhaps it's because it's been considered one of her tamest poems, promoting a simple Christian virtue through the image of queen virtue descending from heaven with her retinue to aid the poet. It hasn't been something that interesting in it for, for scholars. But in the manuscript poem, something very different is happening. Rather than a poem focused on the Christian God alone and the personification of virtue, this variant turns to Hippocrates. Heard of him? I didn't until I came across this variant. <laughs> uh, a Greek name for the Egyptian god Horus, and expresses, uh, issues an express call to other enslaved artists. The Greeks had misunderstood the image of the child Horus with his hands to his uh, lips, which was to indicate childhood, and so interpreted Hippocrates as the god of silence. And that's how he was understood in the 18th century, drawing from uh, the Greeks. In the 18th century, Hippocrates was an emblem for wisdom, esoteric knowledge, he's used by the Masons, and resisting political censorship. Um, the Horus, if it is Horus uh, at the end of the line, might refer to the god Horus, or to the most revered classical poet in 18th century America, the Roman poet Horus. Wheatley Peters scholars have argued, Wald Stryker most recently, that Wheatley Peter engages Horace, who was the son of an enslaved man and wrote of the enslaved in Rome, to make American-style slavery visible and to critique it. The context of the poem and the wider uses of Horace by Wheatley Peters asks us to see this word here as signaling two names in one, perhaps, Horace the sun god becomes Horace the god of silence, becomes Horace the greatest classical poet. So now I'm going to get wildly speculative. Just follow it, follow me for a minute. <laughs> it's, not, it's not in print. Um, <laughs> in closing, I want to think about the silence in the Love Roach poem, I opened not my mouth, O Lord, because, dash. And the silence in this variant as a form of refusal. Theorists of black feminism and visual culture, Tina Camp, defines refusal as a rejection of the status quo as livable and the creation of possibility in the face of negation. A refusal to recognize a system that renders you fundamentally illegible and unintelligible, the decision to reject the terms of diminished subjecthood with which one is presented, using negation as a generative and creative source of disorderly power to embrace the possibility of living otherwise. If silence reigns, let Hippocrates live. Wisdom is silence, the poem asserts earlier, and here it becomes a creative and full silence that reigns and in which Wheatley Peters' poem commands let Hippocrates live. In that state, the poet can peer into the distance. That distance might be heaven, but it also might be possible futures. What is only invisible, or what must be before the future can arise. In this conditional space, she views with amazement the image 
of many horses, feeling the smart of enslavement, toggling into gay friendship, dancing in a godlike form. This new copy changes what I see in Wheatley Peters' famous portrait. And I know we've got some art historian students in the audience, so you'll like this part, I hope. Uh, which was requested by the Countess of Huntington to accompany the book. While it is not a short attribution, scholars have argued that the artist might have been Scipio Moorhead, a friend of Wheatley Peters who was enslaved in Boston and for whom she wrote the poem to S.M., a young African painter, on seeing his works included in her published book. In that poem, we see a collaborative process and mutual inspiration between two black artists, one painter, one poet. So let's for a moment look at this portrait as Scipio might have composed it. And let's look at it in the way that the esteemed scholar Christina Sharp has taught scholars to look to sound an ordinary note of care outside of black negation and dynamics of oppression and agency resistance. So let's imagine a scene from Scipio's placement of Wheatley Peter's finger. Let's say they were playing around a bit, laughing and improvising. And maybe Wheatley Peter started riffing on the Huntington's portrait or the discourse surrounding her poetry. And because they were friends, she put her finger to her temple and tried to look serious. Uh, maybe she looked up, but then turned it into a little eye roll. Maybe she slid down her finger and gestured a little shh for inside joke just between them. Maybe about the publication situation or the uppity countess portrait, or maybe about all of this or none of this. And since we're going to imagine any number of scenes now, let's imagine Scipio had read the manuscript version of Wheatley Peters' poem that included Harpocrates. And he knew the iconography from his own artistic training and interests. Maybe he first mentioned this Egyptian god of silence to Wheatley Peters in one of their many conversations. Maybe as Wheatley Peters had written of their relationship before, the poet and painter conspired and inspired each other. When they were gesturing and playing around, he began to sketch, and he brought the line of her finger down perfectly in line with her lips, a gesture between them, between those in the know, a gesture that wed silence to refusal to create black life and art. Thank you. Everybody. Um, I'm Jackie Hendricks. I'm with the English department, and I'm also here representing our pre-modern studies minor. Um, and so we're just going to do a quick little Q&A um, here with, uh, with uh, Dr. Wendy Roberts uh, before we turn it over to you all for your questions as well. Um, so thank you so much for your wonderful talk. This is so exciting. It was like gave me chills kind of to see um, some of the really cool discoveries um, that you've unearthed uh, through your archival research. Um, so I wanted to sort of in the theme of what we're doing this week um, start off with a question about archival research specifically um, and how you think that being able to go into the archives and do that kind of work uh, has been really instrumental in uh, uh, raising the um, importance of the humanities, especially right now in this moment where it's often under attack. Ooh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Is this on? Okay, yeah. So, um, I mean, I would just say that um, this kind of, well, two things, and, uh, and I think that most people in this audience would know this, right? That um, the archive is both... Um, extremely important in terms of um, helping us uh, understand who we are uh, in relation to the world around us and where we came from uh, to how we got here right but that also that it has its limits and so there's um, the humanities is is I think at a um, a really exciting point right now, and it would be um, 
a real tragedy to pull back on the humanities right now. Um, as an aside, uh, since we're in San Jose, and I know it's like tech country, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my husband is a, um, he, he works for Amazon. Um, <laughs> and uh, he started out, he, he uh, did philosophy of religion and ethics, and that's what his uh, master's was in. And somehow now he's all, he's a, a, a computing architect. Um, and he, so he knows more about this stuff, uh, you know, than I do. But he's like, you know what? Chat GPT and all of this stuff, they can't do what you're doing. Um, and it's only as good as the people who are trained to be able to see the things that are there. Um, at this point in American history, we finally have... Um, a, li a little more equity. We have a little more uh, diversity in who is looking at these documents. Um, and we need uh, the funding and the support. Um, like, we haven't learned everything. We're just learning, right? And it's a different view of knowledge, of, of progressive uh, view of knowledge um, that we need to keep. You know, I could go on, but yeah. Um, another question I would have before I turn it over to the audience um, is I was really interested in what you talked about with like writing communities, commonplace books, um, this kind of idea of, of collaboration, um, even with your last speculation here on, on the portrait as well. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, what does that say about, say, the Quaker culture and how it's responding um, to Phyllis Wheatley Peters as perhaps a leader, um, uh, as someone that they are then uh, transmitting through teaching children to kind of copy these bo these poems and things like that. Um, what she is in that community. Right. So, so I, it's it's yeah, I don't know. It's quite a catch twenty two, but it's sort of a catch twenty two, right? Because um, so I think Peters is changing the way that. Uh, these white Quakers understand their work and their obligation in the world. At the same time, um, like it's not always clear, just because someone, uh, like just because someone copies Wheatley and holds her up, I mean, there's a whole display in the back, right, <laughs> of, of, of white people holding up Wheatley. Well, what, what are they? admiring, uh, what am I admiring, like, what are we admiring, right, um, in a predominantly white institution? So uh, it's, uh, it's complicated, um, and I try to hold both in tension um, because it can get easy to go, oh, Quakers, yes, you know, and, you know, but, but it will, what I really tried to show in this talk, which, um, I didn't do in, in the article um, as I was trying to just really kind of pin attribution. So it ended up being primarily about Mary Powell Potts and right and uh, the all of the things that I could, you know, easily get in the archive to be able to pin down attribution. And in some ways, that kind of shows how archival work can kind of pull you in one direction, right? Like, okay, so now I'm going to talk about all the white women. Um, and even if there's only two documents about Rose, those are two. The poem itself is an amazing document about Rose, right? And there's a lot that can be gleaned from um, the importance of this woman, even if we don't find anything else about her. Um, but I, I, I think we will. I, I will. All right, um, why don't we turn it over then um, to the audience for any of your questions. So we have um, Amy and Michelle coming around. Um, so feel free to throw up your hands. They'll come to you. And if it helps, just so you know, I threw all this at you, and I don't know half of what I'm going to say about it either. So let's just, <laughs> let's just you know, open it up to, like, what do we want to say about these things? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about... What's wrong with seeing Phyllis Wheatley Peters as exceptional? Um, because that's a term that's problematic today. We wouldn't say someone 
of color is exceptional, but it is exceptional as the first African-American published author, African-American woman publishing, and even if we think about slave literacy in English, um, so what's wrong with saying that she is exceptional? I mean, maybe we need to have it both ways. We need to both recognize that this is um, an amazing person who uh, I think is the best poet of early America and um, who is uh, very adept at negotiating multiple publics and communities and um, uh, at the same time as we also don't isolate her, right? And I think um, scholars like Tara Bynum have really kind of shown and reminded us, wait a second, uh, Wheatley Peters was in community and just because uh, the white biographers and families, descendants who want to um, show the Wheatleys in a certain light want to separate her doesn't mean that she was, right? Um, there's a, a um, poem that's uh, in manuscript among the same women that are circulating um, the Love Roach poem uh, and, and the atheism poem. Um, and it's unfortunate because it's not dated, so it may be later, it might not be, but it could be around the same time. And it's by uh, Chloe, a Negro poet. Um, it's more um, uh, of the style of writing that maybe Phyllis's first effort was. Um, but it's a poem by a black poet that we didn't, we didn't know existed. Um, I haven't printed or published anything on it, so I doubt anyone else really knows it exists, right, um, yet. And she's writing. She's, she's writing rhyme couplets. So um, if I'm wrong about the, on Lo the Love Roach poem, right, and there's another poet in 1767, who is 15 years of age, right, who writes in the same kind of style. I think there's so much pointing towards Wheatley that that's the direction I would go. But it's not out of the question. I feel like we've, we've been surprised before of what things we think are possible. At this point, I feel like I've been reading scholarship on Wheatley Peters and, you know, since graduate school. Um, and I, I don't even know what to make. There's two biographies, right? And still, every time I speak, I'm like, I'm not sure that's true, right? I might have just told you all lies. I don't know, <laughs> like not on purpose, but there's just so much. I think it's, um, it's a fine example of what you were asking about. Like, well, why do we need to keep funding this? Why do we need to keep doing this, right? There's a whole generation of, you know, Wheatley and other black poets and early American scholars that are going to blow our minds by what, 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 the, what they find. It takes a long time to find things, right? I just showed you 10 years worth, and I hit, what, three poems? <laughs> like, you know, so um, it's, you know, we didn't, I, I think Cydia, uh, Cydia Hartman says that's on by design, right? Like it's, you're not going to go into a, an archive and find what you're looking for if you're trying to find something that's not part of a structure of white supremacy. You're just not. You, you have to figure out ways to read it differently. Yeah. And for a great talk, um, I w kept thinking about two very disparate people historically and in every other possible way. Thomas Jefferson, who didn't believe that Wheatley wrote her own poems because of the power of racism and confirmation bias, and those were sort of the two contradictory arguments. 
either she wrote them and they're not very good or she didn't write them. And the, he ha thought the same thing about Benjamin Banneker, the mathematician, that he didn't do his own mathematical work because he couldn't have because black people can't do it. Then I was thinking a couple hundred years later of Alice Walker. her use in one of the poems of the image of the goddess divinely fair. Oh, that's why many people, and I assume she mostly meant, I've never known, she doesn't have footnotes, I don't know exactly who she had in mind, that they were possibly were feminists who said, well, look how much Wheatley herself had absorbed the dominant ideology that she imagined because that's who, in her time period, would have been held up as an image of beauty you know, whiteness and blondness and fairness. Our own set of assumptions to think differently, like whether it's to think differently like that might be a poem by her, or whether it's her capacities are very different than someone like Jefferson, you know, clearly would have thought. And I keep thinking about that portrait, reminding me only in a way of the Mona Lisa, because you could read her expression and you could different ways. Or, hi there, I'm not sure you really see me. Or, hi there, you wanted me to be silent and I'm not. Uh, and I mean, you know, the endless, uh, there are other endless possibilities. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, while you were talking, I was thinking about Jeff. Yeah, Jefferson, Jefferson. Um, so, in my opinion, I mean, he's he's just lying, right? He <laughs> he he knows. And also, so so there's another. It's going to be in one of the chapters. There's another poem. Uh, it's footnoted in my book because I didn't. I found it right before. I needed to like get proofs back, and I'm like, I, 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 this is important, but I can't deal with it now. Um, so there's a commonplace book of the Vermont Historical Society, and um, in it, there's this juicy uh, poem, um, and it's juicy because it's clear someone's razored out the majority of the poem. Uh, and, and ironically, of course, the poem is entitled Absence. I'm going to get to Jefferson, <laughs> but I had to kind of set up the scene here. Um, and so this commonplace book was, um, get my facts, it's been a while since I looked at it. Uh, Ruth, Ruth uh, Andrews, the white poet that wrote The Slavery, she, oh. yes, she gave this book to the, the, the copyist and it's, you know, it's scribe, she gave it to her. And so then she's writing poems in it. Um, one of them is a poem that is in direct competition with Wheatley's On Recollection, has the same heading, it's clear they're at the same salon, like, you know, where this like prompt was given and this was the other poet's uh, version of it. Before that, there's a this juice, titillating whatever poem, right? Like, uh, I want to say it's, it's probably to Wheatley. It says, to Miss P.W. Um, and it's by, um, it's late in the day. He'll come to me in a second. The, uh, so it's a male poet. And he's writing, I think, to Phyllis Wheatley. Um, and it's this poem called Absence. And he's kind of thinking about his love and absence through her, who she's, you know, figured for white women this way. So it's kind of him uh, kind of using her figure as this figure of mourning. Um, but the reason I think about Jefferson is because, he, oh, J.B. Cutting. So he is, his brother uh, spends a lot of time with Jefferson. And he, there's another poem that he writes when, um, 
I want to say Sewell, one of the ministers dies that Wheatley Peters uh, writes an elegy to, and he does as well. And they're in a little ele elegate competition, right? And so once you start to see how connected these poets are, and they're writing together about the same things, and they're sharing, right? Um, and then they're keeping them in these commonplace books. And then I'm thinking of this cutting brother spending time with Jefferson, which he know he did. Like, what? He knows. The guy knows she, he, that she wrote the poems. He's, 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 she's, she's writing in competition with, with the brother of the guy he hangs out with. Hi. <laughs> um, so you, you said that, you know, potentially um, uncovering or covering um, two or three or however many um, Wheatley Peters poems in 10 years is um, not very many. I actually think it's a lot. <laughs> um, especially if speculative, speculative <laughs> potential, potential, who knows? Um, I don't, you're probably not lying, but you know. Um, uh, <laughs> And I'm not a, a Wheatley Peters specialist, but um, it seems as though that's, it's like a, it's not as in, you know, the, the 10 years prior to that, there were a lot of new discoveries about her corpus, right? Like this is, this is kind of new and she's a magnet figure in American literary, in literary history globally. Um, are you sort of suggesting that, um, white literary history has kind of forgotten about manuscript circulation and ma right manuscript culture and this is something that we've all really failed to include in our research is that can i quote you <laughs> yes yes yeah. So yeah i'm gonna say it just that way okay. i i i uh wall striker calls it book ended methodologies right um, and it's weird because David Shields, like, what is it, 30 years ago published that, like, all early American poetry want, wanted to be forgotten and wanted to be in manuscript. And still, we talk about the printed, right? Um, I wonder sometimes if it's, uh, it seems to me that women more often are doing manuscript circulation. And so then I think about, well, do we value the women's writing, white or black or indigenous, right? Like, um, and so uh, it's layered, but for whatever reason, yes, we haven't paid attention to manuscripts. Um, and um, in some ways, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a great, uh, arc, like I'm not a great researcher. I just kind of look at things that are in plain sight. I, I really thought my first book, my first book, was about evangelical poetry, and it's everywhere, right? <laughs> but no one wants to read it because it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> But it's everywhere. Go to early American imprints. It's everywhere, right? It didn't take a lot of like sleuthing, um, and and I and I think um, I'll probably get in trouble. But I, I think like the commonplace books are gendered feminine, um, right? And I think it's just not. Um, I had a I had a. Early on, I kind of met some resistance when I was working up the piece. Um, and, you know, someone said, well, it's just a girl. Like, you can't, like, as if you couldn't trust this manuscript because it was just a girl. I think then I ended up writing a more defensive piece that was like, it's a trustworthy manuscript source. <laughs> you know, like, all these reasons why. Uh, because in my mind, I had this person said, well, it's just a 13 year old girl, you know? Um, and so I think that's interesting in and of itself that I want to explore more of as I move in the project, right? Cause Phyllis Wheatley's a girl, right? And 15, 14, um, 
the manuscripts, the, like so Ruth Beryl Andrews, some others, they'll start to kind of introduce their niece or whatever um, in their commonplace books around 12 to 15. It's kind of like they make their debut mm -hmm. into manuscripts. You know, here's a poem my, my niece wrote. So exceptional, but not, right? So when, when Wheatley Peter starts to show up in manuscript around 14, 15, well, that's the time you show up. Right, but you only know that if you're reading other manuscripts that show you that that's the case. Um, yeah. Can I hog this microphone for a second, just to stay with this material, uh, this manuscript uh, culture conversation for a moment? I just found myself, first of all, like stunning talk. Thank you so much. Amazing. I love your reading at the end. Um, but I found myself incredibly preoccupied by the function of copying. And it, it seemed to me that so much of what you're doing is you're finding these copies and then you're kind of tracking them backward, you know, to the source of this author. And I wonder if you've thought about kind of how these moves in the opposite direction, right? And how that might complicate the way we think about readers as writers. So how do we know that these, and I'm not really suggesting necessarily, although of course this is possible that a, that a copy of a poem found elsewhere could have errors or mistakes in it. But what really interests me is the possibility that the, young woman copying this poem is actually changing it. Um, even the, the image you gave us where the you know, words black and rose are sort of extra um, darkened by the writer, like that's an act of writing and interpretation at some level. So I, just, I guess I just want to ask you if you've done any thinking about this and what you see uh, if it has changed the way you think about um, readers in relation to writers around this copying in the commonplace books. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yes and no, in the sense that yes, I want to, and no, I haven't fully yet. Um, I, I feel like a lot of my time so far has been... Um, uh, yeah, trying to like trace things. I felt like I had to get that uh, the piece out in a responsible way and like not just like, kind of keep it for, you know, five years while I work on this other project I'm doing. Um, but yes, and I think as, as I'm really early in this project, Michelle, thank you, um, because I'm thinking about um, how in my first book and I didn't even realize it when I was doing it is I always see the writer or the the reader kind of interacting with a poem being changed by the poem changing the poem in the process like it's this thing that's constantly it has it has a life to it it does things in the world it does things back and the right and so um, how that will play out here, I don't know, but you're right. Like, in some ways, I'm kind of, I'm getting tired of, the, like, okay, trace it back to, to show that it's Wheatley, because that's not really where the, the, the excitement is. I mean, I feel like it's exciting if, um, in the sense that we want all that we can of Wheatley's works, right? But then there's only so much you can do with that. Um, right. And so what does it mean? Um, so in the, in, the same, in the same group, the uh, women, um, the girls copying um, Wheatley's poems um, in other commonplaces books, Haynes and Drinker are their last names. And Joanna Brooks uh, talked about these a long time ago when she kind of first went to women's manuscript culture and Phyllis Wheatley. Um, in the Haynes, I want to say, commonplace book, it begins with um, 
writing, like the art of writing, and it begins in Egypt, right? And like, the girl is like kind of copying this and like where, you know, where are you uh, underlying and how you do it and right and how that changes from commonplace book to commonplace book. I can only say, right, yeah, I, I don't know, but, um, but absolutely correct. And also that makes me think, yeah, and so here again, 14, 15 year old girls being writers. And are they inspired? Like there's ways that they're inspired like in a way that's, you know, uh, I'm sure fully loaded and racist, but also ways that are like, here's a 15 year old girl inspiring me, right, to write. And that matters too, right? Like they, they both have to be there, right? Yeah. Yes. I wanted to circle back to the, there's a, first of all, thank you so much as well. There's so many things you've said that I've thought about, but I was thinking about the point about manuscripts and how we've de-privileged them and this idea of gender, but I also think of how we think about print culture today. And another thing I think about teaching history is how many students can't read cursive now and how so many voices are going to be silenced even further already ignoring it and how we tackle the problem that is becoming not even, I don't know it's there, but even if I know it's there, I can't read it and like how we broach that. And, this, and seeing like the handwriting and then the transcript, I think is so important. But if we're missing that ability to even see that, I think, not that I'm asking for an answer necessarily, but how we kind of recognize that and reconcile that reality. Right, and it's, um, I mean, you're pointing out more inequity too, right? Because the schools that can um, continue to teach uh, cursive, right, are gonna be predominantly white schools, predominantly uh, very funded by exactly. tax dollars, yeah. Um, I mean, the only thing I would say is another reason that we need to offer more English literature courses, and now we get to, like, right, offer in, in handwriting, in, in, right, that it's an actual, it's culturally significant to be able to read documents I, wow, I would love to be able to, to do that, uh, <laughs> even though I could, you know, I would not consider myself a, a, uh, the, the, the best reader of 18th century manuscripts, but I would love to be able to, um, to do that with students. And I think they're actually fascinated by it. I think actually it's, uh, they're fascinated when they can come and be part of something that they can't ask the computer the answer to, right? Um, and, and it's going to take a long time before anyone, you know, it, it, <laughs> all of that stuff is, you know, in the, the computer that you can answer the, ask the question and spits it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in, in your talk thinking about, um, thank you. <coughs> Thinking about the manuscript editions of the poems and changes that occurred between the, the manuscript edition and when it went to print, you know, for publication. And I'm thinking a lot about um, this idea of agency that um, we talk about in special collections classes um, <clears throat> that relates to some in, uh, extent, you know, authorial intent versus what, what gets edited and what's sort of approved for publication. Um, and I, and also in relation to that, I'm thinking about um, our copy of um, Phyllis's memoir and poems, which has dozens of pages of front matter of other people speaking on Phyllis's behalf, which on its face seems like a good thing, but I'm struck by how much um, it seems like they're talking about her like she's not in the room um, and that she doesn't have the kind of the same kind of autonomy and agency um, that certainly white authors have, um, especially male white authors. Um, so that's kind of a comment, but also um, a, a little bit of a self-centered question in relation to one of the newer uh, acquisition that you looked at today and the observation you made about, um, I think it was on the reverse of the title page about it, uh, the, the um, Wheatley and the, the writings of other individuals were specifically selected for the African free schools in New York City. And like, I'm also struck by what it means for that community of educators to askew, you know, a, a work of all white authors in favor of highlighting 
Phyllis Wheatley, Olauda Equiano, Ignacia Sancho, and the others who are there and having um, you know, literature from people they identify with, people from their own community. Um, so I hope I didn't spill the beans too much about that, but I'd love to know a little bit more about your, um, the observations that you made when you <laughs> Applications or you know just in general as it strikes you yeah I'm starting to realize I'm not going to be able to continue to use the disclaimer that I did for my first work which was like oh I don't do past 1773 or whatever right because like uh, yeah so um, so the I feel like there's two things, and I don't want to forget about the, the agency part, because when you said that, I was thinking um, in that special issue, uh, Britt Russert has this great line in um, one of her articles where she basically says, well, I'm not going to argue for uh, about um, Wheatley Peters' agency um, in her poems because she's already done that herself. Like, it was just like this great throwaway line and that just like wiped out like 40 years of like a bunch, a bunch of that's been written on her, right? And it's like, yeah, it's obvious, like that was done, you know, um, so catch up, you know, and it, that was, uh, just came to mind when you said that. But in terms of the, the, the work that you're talking about, um, and I'm going to think more about it, but when I was, I don't remember what date it was, but it's early 19th century. Yeah, so um, just thinking back to the manuscript question, as I was looking through the table of contents, I was like, oh, those are some poems that are showing up in these commonplace books, right? And so I don't necessarily know what it means that that was published by these people and what white people were thinking doing it or whatever. But I do know that there's a, a genealogy or legacy there of these were poems that were kept in commonplace culture before it shows up in this anthology, right? Um, so if we're in the 30s, we're, you know, we're getting to like, I don't even know anymore when to say the heyday of print because like there's so much also great work in the 19th century that's all on manuscript and and you're like oh well then I guess not till the 20th century and uh, I don't know um, so yeah do we have how much time do we have do we have time to look at the um, what do we have time are we done Okay. <laughs> well, if, if anyone here is, uh, is adept at 18th century manuscript reading and you want to have a go at this line that I'm like, it could be this or it could not, uh, we could have fun looking at the handwriting. So, yeah. I would say go ahead, put it up on the slide, and then as we mingle uh, <laughs> and eat and drink and uh, visit with the more students who are about to show up to populate these tables back here, we can try our hand at it. And, and then we can all think about thorax. <laughs> the unasked question. <laughs> Wendy, thank you so much. Thank you.